The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to the Engine Room Unpacked. I'm Sue Viskovich from Elixir, powered by VVP, and I am thrilled to join your host, Andrew Rocks, to unpack the last three episodes of the Engine Room podcast and explore some of the nuggets of gold, brilliant ideas and strategies that were shared by the featured firms, things that you too could deploy in your business to enjoy greater success. Let's get stuck in. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Welcome to another edition of the Engine Room Unpacked. Today, I'm joined with my partner in unpacking, Sue from Elixir. How are you, Sue? Hey, Roxy. I am great. Happy to be back here again. These are so much fun. They are pretty good fun. And I suppose part of the fun is the fact that um, uh, we get a free hit. At We get to look at uh, all of these great guests. Um, they've got no right of reply, which is also fun as well. Um, yeah. my, and and also just having great talent, you know, having having the ability to to unpack uh, people in our industry who are innovators, people in our industry yeah. who've been there and done that, and people in our industry who just like disrupting things. It's fun. So, yeah, sure so, so let's kick off with um, who we're looking to unpack today. Um, and then I'd love, uh, Sue, to find out what themes you would like to um, run for the listeners today. So let's today, do it. Today, um, the, three, the three podcasts that we had, they're all in person. So the first podcast was with the lovely Amy Baker from Recap Advice. The second podcast was uh, Sam Pereira from Pereira Crowther. And the last podcast, I actually flew down to Hobart, was uh, Jonathan or Jano Enniot from Collins SBA. We had uh, great times with everybody. They all got the obligatory photo. And um, I've listened to all of them, obviously, and they've been very, very well received. So three very different businesses, Sue. Very when, I, different. when I challenge you to come up with the themes, <laughs> aka threw you in the deep end, yeah. um, what did you end up with? Well, you are so right, Roxy. They're very, very different. You know, size, shape, um, personalities. Even, even you know, you've got a you got a risk business. You've got a um, consolidated, you know, multidisciplinary accounting, financial planning business. You've got an advice business with a deep uh, investment expertise. And it's hugely different in size. So thank you for that. But there are, as we know, very similar things across the three. Um, so I have drilled them down to the first one. I want to talk about making transformational business decisions because uh, there's some really good examples with all those. Second one, process and systemization. Doesn't matter how big you are. An oldie but a goodie. Oh, it sure is. And it's not boring, I promise. Um, and the third one is having a business owner mindset. It's right. a really interesting one. Right. So I feel that we've deemed down the path of the second and third one before. Mm. But what do you mean by making transformational business decisions? Well, this, and I've got a couple of examples that we're going to throw to, but it's funny, I've been having a few conversations like this lately with some of our clients or some people that are reaching out to us. And and there's a lot of information out there around this is how you can run a good business. There's such awesome podcasts like uh, this one uh, that helps share ideas for people. So just, just before we go on, Kieran, include no links to any other podcast. <laughs> just to, 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 <laughs> just the, the sound guy's looking at me and he's just slitting his throat going, like, yeah, so, so, so <laughs> guys, enjoy. Enjoy Sue's last podcast. <laughs> no, I don't just mean podcasts, Roxy. Okay. There's great speakers on stage and articles and all sorts of stuff. Um, but a lot of these things are um, 
they're great in theory and people hear about how other people do them and and you think, oh, yeah, that makes sense to have processes and systems and so forth. But sometimes the execution of those ideas are a little bit scary and sometimes you got to go outside of your comfort zone to make real transformational change. The little things around the edges, we all love a one percenter, but, you know, making a small change here and there, uh, they're pretty easy things to do. But when you're talking about making an uh, an idea or executing on an idea that's essentially going to halve the number of clients that you deal with, on face value, that's really frightening, right? So Jono was telling us about uh, what they did in terms of their client numbers. So we are going to throw to that quote in a minute, but it's something I've, I've actually, um, there's been a lot of conversation on LinkedIn this past week because I published an article around Dunbar's number and why I think it's actually inappropriate in financial services or in financial planning. So for all of us um, non-Dunbarians, <laughs> what, what is the Dunbar number? Well, Dunbar's theory is that human beings can only have a maximum of roughly 150 human relationships in their life. And I hear this quoted all the time, right? And I, I love the fact that there are some um, really good commentators. In fact, Andrew Inwood, we had this great conversation. He and I have spoken about this a lot. He uses it as a prod to put people outside of their comfort zone and, and help them understand this is not a limit. But I talk to advisors all the time going, oh, Dunbar, you know, nobody can handle more than 150 clients. And my response is always, Dunbar did not have a CRM. Dunbar did not have file notes or a team behind them. This is, we're not talking about social relationships of people that you're going to chat to at barbecues and you want to remember their their client, their, you know, their family names and so forth. We're talking about professional relationships that, yes, are very intimate and deep and you make a huge change to these people's lives, but you've got an infrastructure around you. So I pose this question of what's to actually stop you? If you're limited to 150 now, what would you have to do in your business to be able to serve 300 clients? Because we are not replacing our exiting advisors fast enough. The fact is we haven't got enough advisors to service all of, of the Australians that need advice. We know how powerful advice is. So we have to start thinking differently about this. So I was kind of poking the bear a bit on LinkedIn, which was really fun because um, I love people thinking outside the square. But for a lot of people, in order to do that, it does require transformational change in their business. Gotcha. So Dunbar also didn't have things like landing pages and uh, EDMs and and couldn't harness, as you insinuated, technology. Uh -huh. So when you're talking about that, can I just ask, and we'll come back to Jono's quote, which which uh, which you've just said through to me, it looks good. What were the kind of feedback that you were getting when you threw it out there? So were you advocating people should do more or less or different? So I was posing the question, if, if, if you're limited by this Dunbar's number thinking, let's throw that out the window because it's not relevant in financial advice. Let's start thinking about rather than I cannot see that many people, and I'm not saying everybody should because everybody's got their own business goals, but if we're going to solve this problem, what would you need to do? My, my, I was challenging people. What would you need to do differently than what you do right now if you were going to serve that many people? And it was great because we had a, a, quite a few actually um, – sort of respond that they're already doing that and this is how they've done it. Um, we had an awesome advisor say, yeah, I'd love the idea of this, but right now I've got this many. And if I think about if I see this many reviews and each of those clients needs an SOA, this is how much. And he did a, a bit of um, math. And so I actually did a different type of math on, well, what would it take to be able to do that? You know, yes, you've got meetings. Yes, you've got reviews. A lot of it comes back to put the advisor in the position where they're only doing things that requires a licensed advisor to do and build your technology and your infrastructure of people around them to have them doing their highest and best work and have your clients served with a team serviced approach. And then you'd be amazed at the number of clients that you could actually change lives for. And so the really interesting thing, because as I started listening to Jono on the on the podcast, he actually had done the opposite. He'd actually halved to his client numbers. So I'm thinking, oh, Jono's actually going like against the kind of stuff I'm talking about. But then of course, when you listen to the whole quote, you exactly know why. So why don't we throw to that quote now? Let's roll that through, Kieran. If I go back probably two years ago, um, we had advisors serving about 220 clients on average. Yep. We're down to about 110 at the moment. So I need I, to unpack that. Yeah. People like to go the other way. Yes. Tell me what's – so first of all, um, yeah, tell us. Obviously, you're doing more with the clients and you've – but what was that transition? Uh, I, look, I think we're trying to do everything for everyone. 
and we had uh, a lot of clients that were not profitable for us, let's be honest. Yep. They, they weren't. We're doing a lot for them, not charging enough. Uh, and there were some clients that particularly as we focus more on clients with complexity, not just business owners, but we're moving up the complexity scale. We felt there was a number of clients that we weren't the right advisors to be serving them anymore. Uh, they still needed a trusted advisor. So we went through a process of uh, pricing, but also service articulation and actually helping clients move on. So we actually, just in the last 18 months, reduced our client numbers through sale, pricing, and um politely moving people on uh, by about 200. So we, we currently serve about 450 um, households in the financial planning I imagine planning you didn't team. drop that much revenue. Actually, no. It's actually been yeah held steady. We haven't grown, but we haven't gone backwards. But what we have done is built significant capacity in our team. Yeah. What was interesting um, when uh, I was interviewing John O is that um, when they decided to get less, they were very deliberate about it. Yeah, um, and and I, I just sort of I just couldn't resist. I'm like, did you drop revenue? You know, and because they're a multi AR business, which means that you know they have to build quick systems, but didn't drop revenue. And I've seen no. this, I've seen this in other businesses. And what's your experiences, Sue? Well, you know, as he said, they 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 had a lot of clients that were taking up a lot of time and capacity but were non-profitable clients. And what I see with a lot of firms is that initially if we were to walk in and say, you guys are doing 220 clients right now, well, we're going to take your advisors down to 110 before getting it up to 200 and you're going to double your profit. Um, that's not unusual at all except people then, you don't, you don't want to think of sending people away or casting them out to the wolves to not look after them. The reality is when you actually look at those individual clients with those advisors, a lot of times they actually don't need an ongoing service anymore. They, they, their needs are solved. They might need to come back to you in a couple of years' time. They might Things might change. But there's actually no point in trying to lift those fees because they're not going to get value for them. And so you make a business decision to say, okay, well, there are a subset of clients over here that aren't paying us enough, but they're absolutely getting value. So we're going to lift their fees, but we're also going to turn off the agreements for this other subset of clients that don't really need us. And we're going to lose, in inverted quotes, we're going to lose that revenue. Ah, oh, what happens? And that way we can pave the way for further growth. But to be fair, and, and with Jono's business, they've also got a significant accounting presence. So although sometimes they weren't they, they might not be doing as much financial planning. If they were self-employed people, they were probably bubbling along with their accounting relationships as well. Oh, well, well, oh you mean those clients that they turned yes. off the financial advice fees? Yeah, potentially, yeah. But potentially. Potentially there might have because, because you don't, I mean, there's a real fear because clients take a lot of effort and cost to bring on, right? So there's a real fear of like, quote unquote, casting the wolves. But there's no wolves out there. As you say, it's probably just putting them in, a, in there. But you- by by having another reason that whether it be accounting or checking their home loan or whatever it is, kind of keeps them in your world a bit. I think yes. they they have that luxury. I think. Well, yeah, but I'd challenge you on that too, Roxy, because if you didn't have an accounting arm or a mortgage breaking arm, and you had had that deep relationship for a lot of years, and you've got a great way to communicate with them through. Um, emails and important information and having a marketing strategy that keeps you present and visible in the rest of their world on social media or wherever else, when they do need some help later on, they're not going to go anywhere else. They will come back to you. And I don't think, I mean, it's not that Jono's business maintained their revenue when they turned people off because it was subsidised by the accounting. That wasn't the case at all. No. It was, you know, it was the the uplift of the other clients. But the beauty of all of that, and this is where this whole transformational change thing, that was a big swing, right? That you needed to be really confident and you need to be able to do the numbers and be be um, sure of the fact that the advisors were going to be capable of lifting those other fees and you weren't going to lose clients. And I've done it a million times. It very rarely happens. Um, but that then enabled them to go, right, well, each of our clients are now dealing with 110 clients who are excellent clients. We give tremendous value. They are right within our niche. And I love the way he was talking about their three avatars. You know, they're so clear on the people oh, that they the cool, do business with now. Cool names too. What yeah, were they? Rectal, sort of, oh, um, yeah. uh, oh, no. Oh, I should have written these down before. Oh, you know, yeah, me too, yeah. me too. But they were just oh, that's sweet. That's why people should go back and listen to the original podcast because well, that's really so, good. I, I see what you did there. So, <laughs> um, so that's making transformational change. 
Yeah. Um, the 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 second one which I noted down here was process well, and systemization. I'm going to I'm going to call you back a minute. I don't want to get off this okay. transformational change thing just yet. So that was one example, right? right? In, in you know cutting back your client numbers to to give you capacity to grow. But there was also um, the one that you did with Sam. He. Uh, yeah, he had some great stuff that he was talking about strategic acquisition um, because we know that, yes, it's not all about the sake of growth, but it's about achieving the best that you can and supporting as many clients as you can. There's organic growth. Uh, there's having the capacity to be able to grow. But then, of course, we hear so many more firms nowadays are acquiring clients and acquiring businesses. So why don't we throw to that quote and then we'll, we might chat about that one. So this is the one where he's he's acquired a, a multiple businesses, different type. Yeah, okay. yeah, no yeah. Worries, no worries. We've got that. Kieran, can you roll it? Thank you. Over the course of the last 19 years, we've um, uh, been fortunate enough to acquire five businesses, one uh, fairly sizable um, and, and one other meaningful. Other The other three were um, uh, uh, smallish businesses um, and we were fortunate enough in terms of the first acquisition, um, Janelle was the right hand of uh, Errol Shivers, whose business that we purchased um, and so we got access to this wonderful resource who's been with us um, ever since. Yeah, look, I remember that one and I, I think further to that, Sam um, also in the podcast uh, gives a bit of a tip around uh, his philosophy around paying down principal on the loans, there not just interest only so that it, he was always uh, in a position that if he found an opportunity he could do it. But that's a whole other business lesson. But um, yeah. yeah, so what was your take from the quote, Sue? Well, well, this whole thing around transformational change and there's there's lots of bits in there around if you're going to acquire businesses and clients, you want to have the capacity within your own business to be able to serve those clients. But what he was so fortunate about um, doing uh, is that he not only bought clients and revenue, but he got Janelle. And Janelle is now his practice manager. And as he was saying, she's she's been with him ever since purchasing that business. She had been with Errol Shivers, whose business they purchased, uh, and she has had a tremendous impact on the business. And again, it's this transformational change when you go from being a couple of advisors serving uh, great, doing great service for clients, but then you grow too big and people have to wear the right hats. And how can you serve that many clients and make the right business decisions and execute on your business strategy? That tipping point of getting a practice manager, whether whatever you call them, general manager, practice manager, whatever, but somebody whose role is devoted to running the business as opposed to being in the business and serving clients, that's a massive tipping point for any business. And I know for some it can feel really scary, not only from the investment in, in salary, but also making sure that you find the right person. So sometimes these decisions, you know, he bought a business, great, I'm going to add revenue. And I bet you he didn't have a well, we might have had a slight inclination, but he didn't know the real value in that particular acquisition, and that would have been, you know, getting this Janelle who can then, you know, help them really drive that business forward. Yeah, and the you're right. I mean, uh, quite often when people do acquisitions, they're just focused on the spreadsheet, mm. and they're focused mm. on the accretion of numbers, the, the the cost synergies, the potential revenue synergies. But you can sometimes buy some real intellectual muscle. Yes, um, and just because the practice that you're acquiring may have a succession element, doesn't mean that all of their people have the same timelines. Quite often they do, but not always. Yeah. So, no, yep. you're bang on there. And because it's just, the other side of it is, it's really hard to recruit people. Yeah. So, if you, if, you, if you can get one as part of doing something, yeah. then that's a win. Yes, absolutely right. They know the clients, but they're great at doing what they do. Uh, and you can grow more of a, a business as opposed to individual um, personalities looking after clients really can help you take it to the next level. And I think further well, to I that. I don't say that too many often. How many times do I say, take your business to the next level? Watch me on that one. Is, <laughs> uh, uh, um, is that, uh, it sounds like a song we could do with a karaoke, which, uh, oh, which if I put it, yeah, which, yeah, there you go. So <laughs> for those of you unacquainted to, to Sue um, um, in the after uh, parties. Um, Where are you uh, going with this, Roxy? Well, you're the one. So you're the one that was sort of uh, going off piece. So it's. Uh, <laughs> I thought I'd continue to do that. But uh, anyway, no, the lady can sing. Um, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> well, we, thank you. I mean, goodness gracious, this is. Uh, I'm now going to. I'm now going to bring us back to one of your other themes. <laughs> Good idea. Good idea. Let's but, do that. But, no, what I'm going to say is the transformational piece, yeah. and the engine room is all about that, that other person. Um, you know, separating the role of the 
uh, of, of the practice principal, the business yes. writer, the operations people. And, and quite often it's because they, they just think differently. You yeah. Know? So, yeah. Well, um, different personalities, different. Um, and in fact, I think Jono said that in, in the. Um, in his interview with you around they actually personality profiled all their advisors and even having different personality types and people's natural skill sets and building that into the way that they you, they review their people. It's like, why am I asking you to pull your socks up on this when that's just not who you are? I'm going to play to your strengths. It's kind of a similar kind of thing when you can harness that natural talent, natural ability. I'll tell you what, an advisor with all their skill set and, and ability to connect with humans, they're probably the last person who should be optimizing processes and doing documentation. That's right. And as a fellow parent, um, you you know that it's nature and nurture. Sometimes Absolutely. Some, sometimes people are just are that and it uh, well, yes, the environment counts, but sometimes it's just, you know, harness their strengths. Yes. Um, is is my thoughts. And yes. and speak speaking of strengths, for every yin there's a yang. Uh-huh. And for every person who's an expansive thinker and and very good, there's someone who is in relation to process and systemization. Uh-huh. So I don't think it happens one day when you put an ad on Seek and you go, I need a general manager. I think the mindset's got to start before that. Yes. And for everyone listening who's got, he's at a business stage where they're potentially doing a bit of everything. It's the mindset first and the decision next. Yes. So what's your thoughts on our three guests as far as people who are about to embark on that change, given that that some are a a bit further through it? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, there was, again, this thread that came through around um, running, systemizing businesses, systemizing different elements of the business. So Amy, you know, was a perfect example when she was talking about actually documenting their processes and the way that they captured those because, you know, you could go, oh, look, there's two or three of us in the business. We all know what we're doing. Uh, I don't I don't have to go to a process manual to be able to figure that out. Uh, we'll just do it the way we do it. But, of course, she was smart enough to know, well, I want to be growing, but also I can't automate anything if it's sitting in somebody's head. So she actually could had some really good quotes. So why, why don't we throw that on? I tried so many things like Trello and what's the other one? At Monday, I've tried a lot, but Process Street seems to be the most log- – the way my brain works, I'm enjoying it. I like it. It's really easy to build out and um, we're sort of – we're basically constantly tracking and measuring our process. Because we've been a small team, the reality is that I know I'm going to be – you know, I'm growing. I have got um, – Dr. Catherine Hunt is my um, – business coach and I do have a strategy going forward and I know the team is going to expand. So we've really got to make sure we're capturing everything in that process because otherwise it's just in our heads and on something, you know, in the folders and people, it's, it needs, we needed that roadmap. I guess the practice, what you preach, we plan everything else for other people. There was a point where I realized in my business that that was where I was failing, not only myself and the team, but I was failing the growth of the business if I hadn't. Execution's hard. Yes, there's a few things in there. Um, there's the fact that Amy has attempted initially like to look at some tech solutions um, mm-hmm. and there's plenty of brands out there that do it. But I think ultimately um, you've got to figure out the one that works the way you think. Yes. And, and in fact, I think she actually said, this one actually works the way my brain works. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, I would absolutely endorse that. I mm-hmm. mean, um, that can even come down to the layout, the colors, the the methodology, right? So you do what yeah. works for you. There's no one one winner. The next one, yeah, um, uh, classic. Um, it's always good to be coached. Um, you know, this is not the first time that I've mentioned um, on the Engine Room podcast that that I've had business coaches throughout my career um, mm-hmm. that are clearly Sue. It's something that you advocate for. <laughs> of um, Dr. Catherine Hunt, um, uh, Amy quoted as 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 looking after her and. And uh, as as the podcast went on, I don't know how many quotes we're going to get. I think she was very much saying, "Oh no, Roxy, you're speaking like Amy's speaking." Okay, let's go. Let's do this one. Let's do that one. So yeah. a shout out, a shout out to to, um, to Catherine um, yes. and what she Absolutely. does, and, and the long suffering business coaches. Now, this is not, you know, obviously there's a union of business coaches, Sue. So um, <laughs> uh, I'll let you throw to that. But yeah, another coached person because yes. I don't uh, think people are deficient from knowing what to do. I think they're deficient on trying to do too much. Oh, so true, Roxy. And and I think, you know, it's not just about having the ideas. There's ideas aplenty. Um, 
it is that ability to be able to hone in on the right ideas, have the right connections. But that is the true value. And I know, you know, Dr. Catherine has got a psych background, which is fantastic. Half the time, the work we do as coaches, it's about helping people get out of their own way, see the things that they don't see um, themselves and calling them on it and being able to say, hang on a minute, let, let's just bring you back to here. You just said to me, I can't do X, Y, Z. But actually, that's not true. So what is it that's holding you back? What is it that's getting in your way? And sometimes that's process. Sometimes that's business things. It, it's pricing. It's it's systems and processes. But sometimes it's thinking uh, and people's uh, ability to actually execute on ideas. And, and, you know, Amy is a perfect example. She is, I mean, I listen to her and go, man, I am so uh, uh, deficient in what I'm achieving. Listen to her. You know, she's run this incredible business. She started it when she had three kids and she was a single mom and she's also giving back to the community um, with the profession and on charities and she's an investment group. I mean, wow, I was just tired listening to her. And she would said herself is that's half her problem is that she does say yes to too many things and she spreads herself too thin, which we might actually have another quote on that a little bit later. But this particular one, I want to keep around that whole process and systemization thing because it is, you know, we can all get out, out, out in our own way and we've got loads of ideas and, and we're big thinkers. But in, when you're talking about building out teams to be able to work on client files and all of the technical things that have to be done, building it with the end in mind, just as she said, I'm going to grow this business. If I don't have systems and processes first, I'm not going to be able to get there. And so um, I think the last time we we unpacked um, some episodes, you had recently back in, back then written a piece on on process and, and a bit of that- benchmarking. Um, written a piece. Listen to you. It's a 140 page research report. Written a written a lovely piece. 140 page research report. Um, which which is sadly is not in front of me as we speak. Was before it's in front of me. Well, so with that in mind, what's your what's your <laughs> data driven take on on the upside of systemization? I uh, love it. And and I will absolutely point out. A, I just like we're going to head out the chastising bit for, uh, no, for that's. You? That's why you love me, Roxy, because you could just ask me back too. <laughs> uh, I, but I did lie. It's 124 pages uh, and I didn't write it. I participated in it, but the fabulous Lana Clark wrote it. She's very clever. But the point being is we do absolutely have the data and one of the things that's a critical factor uh, around getting advice turned around and out the door, there is a direct line between the length of time it takes for you to turn advice around and the profitability and the business owner satisfaction because we we asked the question around how many how long does it take you to get advice completed between from initial inquiry to you know getting the advice through the door out, outside and then client signing off and implemented not considering insurance because that's a yeah that whole another rabbit hole but those who could turn it around in under three weeks, three weeks, yes, that's possible. Their average EBIT was up around the 29% compared to those who were taking longer than eight weeks and it was about 22%. So that's just one example of the power of process and making sure your back office is as efficient as it possibly can be, not only for your sleep at night factor, but you know, no client understands or cares the fact that you've got 50 million hoops to jump through and compliance checklists and stuff to do. They have a problem right now. They're coming to you to fix it. The fact that you're going to take 10 weeks to do it, if they knew that when they signed up, they might go and find somebody else. So it's not a good client experience. And that leads me to, I'm going to have to do a little plug myself here, Roxy. I can't help it. Um, since we put out that report, um, one of the things that we're not since, one of the things we always get called upon to do is how do we make transformational change in our back office? How can we process more advice faster and more efficiently with less errors, all of these things that are really difficult when you're running a business. So people say, you know, if you've got this Formula One car and you're actually on the track and you're driving around, the things that need to get fixed, like changing the tires and all the rest of it, they actually have to come in for a pit stop and stop the car to be able to do that. But you can't do that in an advice business because you've constantly got clients coming through the door. Well, you've got client expectations, you've got people that need to be paid. Yes. And and, and also... It's confronting. I mean, it's, it's stopping your business and having a good look at it um, is is confronting because sometimes you know what's wrong with it, but you just yeah. don't want to be told, yeah. right? And you just keep going because it's easier to just keep doing what you've always done. And can I just but, jump in? This yeah. You mentioned you put something out there. We've included a link before. Is that something available or is it something that people come to you, the report? or? or 
How, yeah, how to, yeah. So the the advice operations research report is downloadable from the website. So we'll give you the link for that. Really okay, great. Um, yep. What, what is a, what a woman giving back? Oh, look at that. There you go. Um, but there is something that we can do that's even better than that, and this is what people pay for. Uh, is and and shout out to you, Roxy, because we we talk we've all talked at length for so many years about the engine rooms of advice, and I'm so glad that's what you call this very podcast. We actually have just launched um, an intensive. We call it an intensive. So it's a 10-week program. It's not a done for you. We actually work with the firms. They go through this program. There's 10, we're only going to do 10 firms at a time and we call it the engine room overhaul. So it's essentially a program where you've got to get a practice manager or someone that's actually got the bandwidth to make the change in your business and bring your team along on that journey and you've got to give them uh, the ability to make some decisions. But they will come into the program once a week. We will sit them down. We will take them through the next steps. We will go through process, get all the, the tools and systems and templates and everything to be able to do it to completely overhaul uh, the back office of an advice business. So fixing up their processes, optimizing them, getting ready for automation, solving your wrong people doing the wrong roles, getting your workflows happening, uh, just all of that will be nailed in a 10-week period because what normally happens is people get started and then some people in the business push back, no, we don't like it doing that way, we can't get agreement on what we're going to do. And quite frankly, even those clever thinkers that are sticklers for detail and they love the admin stuff, even they often end up finding that it's much more fun to go and talk to clients and put some other fires out and play with other things rather than do that overhaul and the pit stop while the car's still going. Okay, so, so, we'll so we've got... Them- We've got fire, fires, we've got engine rooms, um, <laughs> but just just to, I suppose, to drill down on that, that's um, that's a 10-week total time commitment, but the reality is it's one day a week or a couple of hours a week. Yeah, it's a couple of hours a week with us, and then they gotcha. go and do the things in gotcha. the office, in the business, gotcha. with the team, and then they come back, and then we help troubleshoot it. I'm, and I'm, I'm, ju- I'm just playing out if I'm running a business, okay, that well, that that's good. I mean, great. And, and, and as you say, um, sometimes people get 80% of the way there or even, or even less, and yeah. they just and what and would be stop. great it'd be great to have like a couple of peers as well. We've had some we've had some cracking practice managers and GMs on this yeah. uh, show over the last two years. We sure have. And and I know that a lot of them talk to each other now, and I really yeah. get a real kick out of that. You know, so yeah, yeah. It, it used to be that the advisors would just chat to other advisors about stuff. Yeah. And for all the advisors listening, listening, your stuff's important, right? I spoke with <laughs> a couple of you today, even, and you spoke about investments, you spoke about client stuff, but. The other stuff, which is the business, your business is very important. So let's talk about um, some systems. And we just can't get away from the fact that we're intrinsically linked to technology. Yeah. Um, and all of the, all of the practices um, that uh, we're unpacking, is there any that stood out as far as a, 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 tech, a tech Oh, absolutely. Enlightenment? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I mean, you can't go past Jono's Salesforce Oh, what's the? I want to say behemoth. I mean, what they have done with Salesforce, they have cracked the code. They've got an accounting and financial planning business. They all use the same system. It is fully integrated. It's inbuilt with lots of different apps that do different, um, unique have different unique purposes. But the central source of truth for their whole business is Salesforce. Um, and so that's a beautiful that what he's done there is a dream. Um, but again, it doesn't have to be Salesforce as the tool. Uh, yes, they're a big business. Yes, he's built that over a lot of years and invested a lot of money in it. And you have to listen to the uh, uh, please listen to Jono's one because he does talk about the experience they had. They had an external company, it didn't work out. Now they've got somebody internal. So it's not about going, oh, sales first doesn't work. We're going to give up on it. If he had have done that, oh my gosh, he wouldn't be anywhere near he is today. You, you, you're completely correct, right? Like if you just if you just took that on on face value, you go, Jonathan gets wins every time. But he was completely honest with the fact that they went down a few rabbit holes. Oh they, yeah, they, they 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 had to, and and that's the best thing about the engine room is getting is talking to well accomplished people and them being really honest with the fact that they did that and it worked and they did that and it didn't work. So let's yeah. throw to um uh, to Jono from Collins SPA. 
Yeah, we've got this quote, which actually isn't to do with Salesforce because that's a bigger thing, but I was fascinated around the investment uh, philosophy. So when we're talking about systems and processes, we're not just talking about um, workflow systems to send this document here and have a process map. It's also around the fundamentals of how you actually deliver what you do. He's systemized their investment management, very different to way, the way Amy do it, two very, very different investment um, philosophies and value propositions. But just have a listen to what he's talking about, where they really, really focus with their advisors. And individually manage account structure. So we were early adopters of that. And that was, um, that didn't work well with our licensee at the time, um, Godfrey Pembroke. Um, it was That's, new for them. Yep. And, you know, it, it had to deal with an IMA from a compliance point of view. That was one of the catalysts for us to be going self-licensed yep. because we knew this was the future for us was... Let's focus on a client's goals, strategy, and outcomes. And yes, we need to take on the responsibility of investment and insurance and you know product. But we felt an MDA solution was the best way to do that. So, you know, we, we've been doing that since 2013. So, as a licensee, we have what we call our preferred portfolios, um, not a, an APL with you know lots of um, securities on it. So. That we see, and, and we've actually um, just done another part of a research report uh, with Lonsec looking at the impact of managed accounts and systemizing the way investments are managed. You know, if you have to be sending out ROAs, if you've got to get documentation and signatures from clients before you can do anything and everything in their portfolio, that is a real drain on efficiency and outcomes for clients. So, you know, Jono's nailed it. They, they've got that. It is a system. It is a it is a um, machine that runs in the business, delivers great outcomes for clients, and their advisors focus on, um, you know, what they're doing with clients. And that last line there, that's the goal bit, I reckon, Roxy. You know, this was partly around their uh, reducing client numbers per advisor, but now they've got the ability to decide how are they going to align their advisors with their clients. And just that line, they're the sort of things we're toying with at the moment because we've got the capacity to think about it. It's not just capacity of how many clients can advise to serve, but it's that brain capacity to stop being so busy and to be able to think about different ways of doing things and then actually make those big decisions that create that transformational change. I love that. It was just such a golden moment. You're completely, you're completely correct. And as, as I was listening to you the last couple of uh, last 10 minutes, um, you've been talking about businesses that have been focused on investment. So if you look at um, uh, recap advice, Amy Baker and, and Collins SBA, they're, they've got a lot of investments yeah. um, investments as a big part of their business, whereas whereas Sa- Sam actually has uh, is, a, is a life insurance specialist. He is, yeah. Um, wh- one of the rare breed, in fact, um, uh, which, which – and he was lamenting, and I don't have the quote at me, uh, with me, but he was lamenting the inability um, at the moment to get a really good tech Delivery. Mm-hmm. Um, I think right. I think he had his fingers crossed for for life bid, and and I know that I think he also referenced a few other practices like M, um, MBS and whatnot that are putting some money into it. Yeah. So we need to make sure that that for all of the people who are doing life insurance is that that it, it's completely the same. You know, systemization yeah. and also yeah. push pushing back on the life insurers and attempting to make sure that 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 they're actually giving you the data and the ability to. Yeah run professional practices is, is paramount. Yeah. And look, I, I'm, I'm going to have to do a shout out. We didn't plan this, but, um, you know, I've got a lot of our firms that have really struggled with this. You know, their focus is on the broader wealth management, but they have a lot of risk policies uh, over time and it's really hard to get the good data on them. But there's a, a provider called CDM Solutions, um, very small provider. Shout out to Catrill in, uh, in Victoria They've had to do some uh, somewhat unusual uh, techniques to be able to get the data out of insurers, but I know a lot of firms that are using that and they've got the most brilliant uh, visibility over the policies, over the age bases of their clients, over the uh, the sums insured and due dates and all sorts of things. It's a really neat system. It's, uh, yeah, yay, we really hope LifeBid comes off, but in the meantime, uh, CDM does an awful lot of that. So, so shout out, and we'll include the links there. And um, now that Julian Assange is back in Australia, using their <laughs> WikiLinks workaround for data is probably a very useful um, attribute. Uh, just I don't just think there. that's what they use, but okay. 
Yeah, the thoughts and opinions of Andrew Rocks not represent the greater ensemble group. I haven't done that one for a while, but it's always, good to, roll, it it's always yeah. good to roll the arm over. We'll be yeah. editing that out, Karen. But uh, hey, but when you, um, you, you mentioned Sam there, and it's a really good segue um, because, you know, we're talking about this whole thing around running it like a business and the mindset of a business owner. Uh, I think you know, not being afraid to think in this way. So regardless, if somebody's listening to this and they're really just starting out or they've still got a small business and they think, gosh, to be able to get to where Jono is is a million miles away, uh, there's a really good quote from Sam, I think, and it was actually right at the beginning of the podcast and as soon as I heard it, I'm like, oh, you've got me, Sam. I love it. Why don't we throw to that? So I consider myself a business owner and a business person first um, and a financial advisor second. Uh, and and I learned that very early on in my career when I started in 2005. Um, and, and um, my dear friend, Russell Collins, who's a, a legend in our profession and a great mentor, probably someone that's uh, been the person that's most shaped my professional career, um, said very early on, it was a client concept. He said, there are two sources of income, man at work and capital at work. And obviously with man at work, there are only so many hours. Um, and this concept uh, really rung true with me. So over the course of the 19 years that we've been in business, uh, I have, um, you know, worked hard of putting our, our capital at work, uh, our, our human beings, our team um, and our financial capital and continue to invest and reinvest in the business. Um, so here we are in uh, June 2024, 20, nearly 19 years on and um Got a, a, a wonderful team of eight uh, servicing about a thousand clients, mostly professionals and some corporates, um, in looking after their risk management and insurance um, insurance need. Yeah, so you're right. Um, I think uh, uh, you know I always ask guests to give um, you know some positive shout outs to people who've helped them throughout their career. You know, a bit of their backstory. Um, and uh, Sam brought up Russell Collins, who um, I remember doing Russell Collins business insurance. Um, uh, learnings and, and education with, with with himself many many years ago, yeah. And he's an absolute legend, and it was great right to have him in a shout out. And it was, and I know that um, subsequently Sam put a post out, and there was just a lot of Russell Collins love. On oh, that. he's a lovely man. That's right. So over to you, Sue. Yeah. Well, it's um, you know, when we were on that thought process of you know thinking like a business, you know, I say Russell's a lovely man because he absolutely is. He's 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 a, a true gentleman. And also was one of the very, very early people to be talking about running the, you know, the, a life business as a business and, and, you know, putting good structure around it. So, um, yeah, he's, he's um, yeah, a, a true inspiration. But it was interesting with this, um, the mindset thing, right? Because not everybody starts with a massive business. And so listening to Amy and what she's created, and I do, I, you know, bless you, Amy, you, you're fabulous. Lots of people talk about imposter syndrome uh, and I think almost every successful person I've ever met has it to some degree. But I love the way uh, Amy actually explained it and put a little bit more colour around this is and going a little bit deeper around how her brain works. You know, we talk about she's yes all over herself, but really fascinating what she shared with that. Why don't we throw to that? But I've also recognised and with working with her how much I was spreading myself too thin um, and, you know, that I was, we looked, you know, one of the exercises she did with me was like, Jesus, the amount of work that I've done for free for in the amount of study I've done that's not actually, you know, study in terms of, oh, yeah, there's a degree, but in terms of my own self-study and the books that I've read and all that experience, she kind of brought to my attention that, um, you know, I'm very experienced, but I wasn't valuing myself. And so- Why do you think that was? See, this imposter syndrome thing, it didn't really go away. I was going to say- It's, it's, a, called, yeah. it's called avoidance. Yep. Yeah. And so I've recognized this stuff in me. And this is, I guess, why the, you know, the money mindset coach becomes the money mindset coach because you recognize the stuff in yourself. So when I started doing coaching, I was like, oh, okay, yeah. now I understand that the brain's working. I sort of realized that, you know, besides the fact that I love neuroscience and neuroplasticity, I started recognizing my own crap and I worked through that. And that's why I like working with someone like Catherine because she calls you out. She can sort of see it, but she also gives you that time to get there. And she's given me that time and I'm kind of recognized, yeah, avoidance is one. Keep myself super busy and I have been probably a bit too afraid of some of the successes that are laying for me 
because I was like, that means change. And I'm, you know, we all have those un, the illogical fears, but that's how the brain works. They're not always real, but there's been things that I've been like, why am I so scared? I know a fair bit of our financial planners and when they say imposter syndrome, well, I, I, I just don't think it's anywhere near the truth, right? So, so they might feel that way, but when I think imposter syndrome, I'm thinking Millie Vanilli in, uh, <laughs> in the late 80s. Shout out to uh, Fab, 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 big listener, great yeah. dancer, can't sing for <laughs> shit. So Amy, not an imposter, but um, ha- ha- having that, um, that feeling, um, I sometimes is all part of the overwhelm. And and that's yes. that's that's the byproduct of having, you know, of caring, yes. so much for clients and caring the about the outcome that you yes. can deliver to them and and what you're doing for them. Yeah, yeah, that's so right. And and you look, there was there was both elements in that quote too, wasn't there? There's the bit around you know getting in your own way and having these illogical fears. Even though she's got such a great business mind and is a great business owner, um, that you know, even the best business owners will still have these illogical fears. But the other thing that it re- represented there was that inability to value yourself, because what financial advisors do, not only from their technical competence, but also their ability to help. Uh, again, we talk advisors getting out of their own way, but people getting out of their own way about making great money decisions and achieving more out of their life and and having more happiness and less stress around money. All of those things are incredibly valuable, but because they come so naturally to most advisors and it is their passion and their vocation, it is very easy to undervalue that. So, you know, well, gosh, we've done a full circle now, Roxy, back to that example of Jono talking about, you know, releasing some clients because they weren't paying enough because they weren't getting value. There's a line between undervaluing yourself because you haven't quoted enough and you can lift your fees and people will pay you what you're worth with then the line of, but some people don't need that level of service anymore and therefore you don't need to be continuing to renew them on a, on a fee that's not going to represent value. Such an esoteric thing, isn't it? Well, we're getting deep today, Roxy. Well, it is, it is. <laughs> and, and, and you know, the, the whole, my motivation for doing, or for actually being involved with Ensemble previously, that's why I start with is I just wish that this kind of content, this kind of ability to hear from people who've, who've, who are doing really good things was available when I was in my 20s. Yeah. Um, it's it's just really, really good. And I suppose before I go on, it'd be remiss, remiss of me not to include uh, Millie Vanilli. We've got two links. We've got Blame It on the Rain and Girl, I'm Going to Miss You. So we've, <laughs> but uh, hey, also if, link if, to the, um, the doco on, on Netflix. I cried. It was actually really good. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Fab and Rob. I, 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 sorry, if Rob, it's um, for such legitimate data, it'd be a real tragedy well, if I didn't, didn't mention now, your sorry. name. <laughs> oh, Debbie Downer. <laughs> yeah, I have to watch the- the uh, the Netflix doco. <laughs> uh, well, well, that's well, a chance, isn't it? At, 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 at the at the funeral, was the eulogy a mute? <laughs> was right, it a mime? I, think, I think we're going to wrap this up now, Roxy. <laughs> we are going way uh, off. Please. Okay, okay, we're coming back. We're coming back. <laughs> but you're right. You're right. Absolutely. Um, so no, no. Um, that that I think that comes about, and this is a whole. So I was in a session the other day, and. Um, I think it's Mark Zagler's was yet. Yeah, that's yeah. him. Um, he was saying that that they see businesses that get to two to three million dollars turnover and they get a bit of a a, a, a sort of a, a wobble? resistance, yeah, and then seven to eight. Right. And um, you know, my, my time at um, VBP, sort of seeing these people from afar and also not from that afar, like looking yeah. under their engine. Um, a lot of that is when people go through the the cycle of the fear. Of uh, imposter syndrome, the the acceptance of what you are, um, you know, the 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 anger that you can't do what you used to do as a financial planner fifteen years ago, and that anger sometimes right is is directed at at legislation and just things you can't control. But then you get to acceptance where people have let go, they've got their practice managers in there, they've priced their clients well, and they've learned to live with the fact that it's okay to say no. To yes. new clients and 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 to existing clients. Now, the the, the negative byproduct of that is we've just got a significant number of unadvised clients in Australia. But this podcast is not designed to solve that problem. No, that's, that's why correct. we vote. Mm-hmm. So, um, getting back to the business owner's mindset, or, or would you like to keep going with process and systemization? Yeah, Sorry, I don't know. No, that was mindset. We've ticked that box. I think we have uh, we have delved into the 
deep, dark recesses of people's mindset and uh, you might look at a business and go, wow, these people have got it going on. Look at them. They're on Roxy's podcast. They are heroes of our profession, but everybody second guesses themselves. So if you're sitting out there going, I'm not good enough for this or how am I ever going to achieve this, stop that self-talk because, uh, you know, nobody's perfect. We all go through these uh, thought processes and there is a plethora of opportunities out there for you to upskill, uh, for you to invest in yourself and your business. And the bottom line is we want more effective businesses. What is the tagline of Ensemble Roxy? What are we all here to do? What do we live by? The positive evolution of financial advice. That's exactly right. I love it. 100%. And the other observation of these businesses are that they're they were in different states. Um, the Aust- Australia is is a big country, but uh-huh. financial planning is a small industry profession. If, that's right. If a profession, I've just been. We're going to edit that out. We're going to try to anyway. <laughs> no, um, <all> right, <laughs> profession. If I've uh, so I put my hand out, sorry, apologies. <laughs> um, a, a small profession, but yeah. it's a profession that is increasingly willing to embrace helping each other. Absolutely. Um, as because we just don't compete against each other. What we're competing against is our ability to deliver advice yep. in the quality and the quantity that we want. Yeah. So, that's it. Um, Sue, thank you as always for unpacking these episodes. That was my pleasure. For those of you that um, haven't seen some of the episodes, they're available. Just go back and link in there. Um, uh, also, all the guests who come on uh, the podcast are open to be approached. So if, if you want to do that, either come from myself or reach out to them. Um, I mean, they, they come on to give. They're giving types of people. So no. don't feel as if, if if they're unapproachable. They they want to be part of the community and that's um, them yeah. giving. Yeah, definitely right. You don't pay them to come on here. <laughs> oh, God, no. God, no. No, no, no. So it's, when we said the positive evolution of financial advice – um, that, that that's it. No, this uh, everyone's contributing uh, to lift all of us a lot. It's it's great. It's great. And look, with that, I'd like to thank you as always um, for being on the engine room, Sue. Um, oh, we, we, our, our levity was probably a dial to eleven today. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think I think I think that's uh, got to be with a uh, too many coffees and too little food for both of us. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we'll put the disclaimer up, Kieran, if we could do that. Um, a big, a big thank you to everyone who makes it happen here. And um, again, and finally, thank you, Sue, for working with me today to demystify a few wonderful points. My pleasure. See you next time. Bye.